that says natural language understanding in the real world. It's a very yes. big title. Uh, I'm very uh, happy with our marketing folks for getting us to a place where I'm willing to be bold enough to say that. You'll see in a minute um, as I go through my presentation that this is a little bit tongue in cheek. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through a bit about myself, a bit about Chisel, the company that I work with. We're going to talk a little bit about the hype in the ML world in general. We're going to talk about what the realistic expectations I think should look like. Um, we're going to talk a bit about commercial insurance because that's the field that we work in at Chisel. And then I'm going to tell you a bit about the stack we use, the techniques we use underneath that to get the results that we get. And then I'm going to show you some examples. Okay. All right. So a bit about me. Uh, my name's Colin Toll. I'm CTO at Chisel AI. Uh, I'm a software developer. I'm a husband and a father. I graduated way too long ago uh, from Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. Um, I don't position myself as an AI expert. My area of expertise is really in software development, building great teams, building great large scale distributed web based applications. That's where I've spent my career. Um, but from the time really at Amazon through to present, software has become more and more oriented around machine learning because it allows us to tackle some problems that you can't tackle any other way. So I like to describe us at Chisel as a insurance software company that's powered by ML because the problem we solve can only be solved that way. Okay, so about us at Chisel. Um, I'm really proud of this company. I'm really proud of my involvement with them. We're based in Toronto, but we're a fully distributed team. We have people in different cities across Canada. Uh, we've been named a digital disruptor by Next. We've won an innovation award from Zurich. It's a very large commercial insurance carrier that we're proud to work um, with in that contest. Uh, we build a SaaS-based natural language processing and machine learning platform for the commercial insurance placement market. Okay, that's a mouthful. Everybody, I think, in this group knows what natural language processing is. They know what machine learning is. They may not know what commercial insurance placement is. And lucky for all of you, I'm going to explain that tonight. It's only two slides. It'll go really quickly, but it'll help understand, help to illuminate why uh, it's a really exciting and interesting domain to apply these technologies. Okay. Um, you can also see, you know, great diversity inside of our company. I'm very proud of that. And, you know, we're uh, very well supported by a slate of fantastic investors um, that have helped us bootstrap and make the progress we've made so far. All right. Slide number one, the hype. So this is uh, Flavor Flav, it's my favorite hype man. Um, he's famous for a particular quote, which is, of course, don't believe the hype. Uh, does anybody in this group remember Flavor Flav? Am I it? He was a hip hop legend before Flavor of Love and before now where I think he's not really, I guess he's he's like Lil John would be today. Anyway, you'll see that I show my age a couple of times through this presentation. Okay, so I'm not gonna demo something that looks like, uh, here's a great Kaggle data set and here's a neural network architecture that produces you know, two points of lift on precision. I'm not gonna show anything like that. Uh, instead, I wanna talk about existing tools that can solve real problems when stacked together that don't need millions and millions and millions of dollars in GPT-3 style giant architecture training, okay? We're going to start with this. Um, this slide is a famous picture by a famous roboticist named Hans Moravec. It's one of my favorite illustrations. You see it all the time in magazine articles and newspaper articles. And it's always the pretense that says sometime in the next 20 to 40 years, our robot overlords will take over and will make really nice pets for some artificial general intelligence that represents a singularity. So according to the progression, right, this kind of uh, exponential growth that you see on a logarithmic chart like this, uh, we got about 22 years left before the machine takes over. You know, the whales and the elephants and Sean Penn up there in the corner, they have a few more years after that, but it looks like this is the rate of change that we are expecting. Now, some interesting things about this chart, 
you'll see that the human they represent is a caveman, which I think is always an interesting choice. The robot van shows up right here next to the VCR. So somebody should let Elon know that, you know, that's that's been solved already. Um, the progress through this exponentially is a really, really interesting thing. It's an optimistic and pessimistic projection, right? This thing is always jumping by factors of a thousand. And the gaps we see here between like a monkey and a human and, you know, a human and Sean Penn, they're not that big. Okay. So um, what does this mean for us? Well, we're here. Okay. That's the DGX1 A100. A lot of folks are probably familiar with that box. If you take a lot of GPU and you take a very exotic memory architecture and you put it together, you get a quarter of a million dollar server. That quarter of a million dollar server is roughly the, you know, the equivalent biological calculation ability of a golden retriever, maybe a highly motivated border collie. Okay. And that's the state of the art today. Okay, it's 22 years before the singularity takes over. We have to talk about what problems we can solve today and how to reasonably solve them. The pop culture hype says, you know, that it's going to be a lot, you know, faster and a lot more dramatic. And it sets expectations with the people that we sell to, sets expectations with the customers we work with, the end users that want to use our system, that we're a lot further along than we are. Realistically, what we have in the state of the art best hardware that's commercially available today is, you know, is a highly motivated golden retriever. Okay. So what does that mean for us? Like what kinds of problems can we solve with a highly motivated golden retriever? It turns out a lot. Okay. Um, when you talk about artificial intelligence, the thing people always jump to is, you know, autonomous driving. So if you know if you string together enough DGX ones and you train them really well, and you know they're easier to train than than border collies, it's a lot less messy. PETA doesn't get upset at the negative training examples, so they're a lot easier to work with. You can do it a lot faster typically than training dogs to drive cars. Um, but if you get enough of them together, then you can operate a whole fleet of Teslas on a whole you know data center full of this kind of hardware. It's a very interesting problem. It's a hard problem, self-driving, right? It's control theory. It's machine learning. Uh, it takes enormous talent and enormous ability to do this. Um, but it's really interesting because it is not the kind of hard problem that Hans Moravec had in mind when he drew that chart. Uh, he talks about the hardest problems being the ones that are subtle and a bit sort of invisible to us. So he has this thing he calls more of X paradox. It says that the difficulty of reverse engineering a human skill is roughly proportional to the amount of time it takes for nature to evolve that skill in people. The oldest human skills are so, um, so transparent to us, so invisible to us that they're very, very, very difficult for us to understand and automate. These are things like attention, right? And, you know, fundamentally being able to effectively communicate. Okay. So the analogy I always use is can, can a four-year-old or a five-year-old do it? If a four-year-old or five-year-old can do it innately, it's probably really, really difficult to automate. If it's something that takes lots of training, you have to wait till you're 16, there's a bunch of rules you need to learn, there's a bunch of affordances in the world, signs telling you what to do, lines painted on roads, all these things that tell you how to safely operate a car, that's probably something that is more well understood, more conceptually accessible to machine learning than something like fundamental attention. Okay? So these kinds of problems are harder. Um, we're talking about language tonight, natural language understanding particularly, and it is classically hard. There are problems like co-reference resolution, and there are problems in linguistics that we aren't even really sure how they work, except they work. So being able to automate those is really, really difficult. So what does that mean for us? Well, um, it sounds demoralizing, but it's not because 
there are still a lot of really interesting problems that we can solve using existing natural language understanding and natural language processing tools that don't require real understanding. They're fundamental, fundamentally mimicry, but they're very effective, very commercially viable, very successful um, natural language tasks that we can do. Typically, they require a constrained and specific domain that you can model well and then identify categories of information incorrectly and then build out the underlying understanding of that constrained world in a way that it can be referenced very well with the patterns that can be recognized with things like entity recognition. Okay, so that's my preamble. A little bit about the hype cycle being a bit overblown. Our state of the art is, you know, really we've got some electric speed dog brains that can work pretty well, that we can train well, um, but they're not going to solve all of the customer expectation baked into AI hype currently. Okay, things like co-reference resolution are still going to be elusive and difficult problems. And, you know, that doesn't stop us. That doesn't mean we can't deliver value. It just means that we're going to work a little bit differently on those things. Okay, let's talk a little bit about insurance. Um, insurance has a lot of data and it depends on a lot of data. Okay, it's essentially, um, it's almost like a backwards casino, right? Something good happens to you, you get paid out at a casino. Something bad happens to you in insurance and they help you mitigate that risk. It's super, super important. Um, and it has an enormous amount of data that's growing every day. Uh, the stat that I have to quote here says that um, like 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. I've heard that every two years. So it seems like it's continuing. A lot of that stuff is network traffic and devices, but in insurance, it's also paperwork. Okay, we'll talk a bit about why that is. Okay, that data that's locked up in paperwork for insurance is the most valuable data they have. It's the conditions under which the agreements allow them to pay claims. It's the descriptions of the businesses that help them evaluate the risks that they're deciding to pay or not. It's uh, rich, detailed, and it is in language for the most part. Okay, uh, commercial insurance is a placement business. That means you have a broker in the middle. Okay, the broker's job is to place the insurance needs of a customer with a carrier. Okay, they do that for commission and they are trusted by the carrier to correctly and accurately represent the customer and they're trusted by the customer to make a great deal with the carrier. Okay, uh, the other thing to consider about uh, commercial insurance specifically is it is not commodity. Okay, there's not very many businesses that are exactly like other businesses. Um, even, you know, things that are rote like pizza places. They have enough difference in terms of how they're staffed, how they're organized, um, how much business they do, where they're located, that each one of those risks is treated uniquely and understood fully by a broker communicated to an underwriter who makes a decision. Now, if you're doing something really unusual, like you're running a robot car company, you're going to need really good product liability in case the robot cars make a mistake. That's a very specific need. You're going to want to make sure your broker understands. Okay. The other thing about commercial insurance, and I've worked in a bunch of different industries across my career, commercial insurers are great customers. Okay. They believe in math and they compete on math. If you're a statistician or probabilities person, um, you probably go to work in a couple of different industries, casino gaming, uh, quantitative analysis and stock trading, which is another kind of casino gaming, uh, or insurance. Oh, and machine learning. It's probably another one that you would work in. Okay. So it's got this business. It's got lots and lots of unstructured complex paperwork. Okay. Commercial insurance does business in written language, legibility, um, Accessibility, meaning that all the brokers, all the carriers need to be able to read each other's paperwork. Legibility, meaning it's got to be well understood and consistent for each other. And the flexibility of paper um, make language, make written language a great fit for this market and for the nature of its product. The types of documents you see are everything from um, applications and submissions to apply for insurance, claims histories, appraisals, financial statements. And then there's like the hardcore documents that are specific to insurance, the proposals and quotes, 
the binders and the actual policy paper. Okay, it has a superpower, right? Which is it's the paper super flexible for it. It allows it to do business with people very, very quickly. It also has a weakness, which is that machines don't read this paper very well. So there's an entire aspect of digital, what they call digital transformation, right? Is the ability to use this data to support decisions, to improve the customer experience, to speed up the overall placement business that they can't do today because they need to get the information out of the paperwork and into bytes where it can be processed. Okay, so how do we do that? So we don't invent brand new neural network architectures. We don't do any kind of super cutting edge research at this stage. That's not to say that we don't in the future, but right now we're focused on using existing tools that are available in the market, stacking them together, identifying the specific point problems that drive our recall and our precision and solving those point problems so that we can meaningfully summarize the contents of a wide variety of paper that comes through the insurance business, even though it is textual in a lot of cases, it is visually rich and structural in a lot of cases. Um, we have to be able to consistently pull the right summary out of that information. And the summary, um, really the key that enables us to do this is we have a really good ontological understanding of the data that's in the paper. We have a really good model of priors and a real consistency across the industry of the concepts they use to evaluate and price risk. Without that constrained domain, that specific conceptual shared set of priors across the industry, what we do would be really, really difficult. Okay. But by stacking these techniques together, we get summaries that are correct in terms of the extracted information being correctly summar being summarized, being a summary that is reflective of the source document uh, nine times out of 10 in a wide variety of documents. Okay. So what are underneath these things? Well, Textual machine learning is a supervised NLP. So we have a large corporate training documents. We've labeled those training documents using experts. Uh, we built training sets out of them and we use those training sets to do both entity recognition and document classification. Pretty common run of the mill natural language processing. Okay, we use a combination of general models that model things like place names and org names and currency values. And then we have very specialized fine tuned models we've trained on top of that, that do things like recognize a coverage name, which is a very specific sort of insurance term. Okay. We have structural, both classifications and heuristics that we use. Okay. This is information taken from the visual layout of the document, the bounding boxes around individual words, the segmentation we can do on a page, the white space separation clustering, all of those things enable us to correlate better the textual information that we're extracting to help us build these multi-part entities that make up the object model of insurance that we share across customers. And that's our last part is this ontology section. We categorize and understand the nature of the information inside of this paperwork we fill it in with a combination of that textual and structural classification and extraction. And then we use knowledge graphs, probably a heavy handed word. We use some normalization rules. We use some existing data that we're collecting as a result of processing to drive up our precision. Okay, this includes things like understanding that a limit, for example, is composed of a particular risk name, a particular money value and a particular basis. Having that understanding of the composition of a limit means that when we find those things in proximity to each other on a page, because we find them textually as well as we find them structurally, we can stitch those together to produce a single entity that makes sense in an insurance standpoint that's called a limit. Now we can also scrub that limit value against its expected domain and range, as well as other contexts that we have and tell us whether or not we think that that set of predictions uh, results in a valid limit or not. So it's really these three things sort of working together for us that drives our precision up. Okay. So some, you know, more concrete examples, 
Uh, we're going to use our Sean Penn analogy here. Uh, using a little bit of his Wikipedia page, you can see uh, different kinds of text classification. The ones that are bolded are the ones that we use or the ones that we enable. All right, so sentiment analysis, we don't really use very much. Translation, while there's probably something interesting with transformers and some of the translation frameworks that might shorten a step or two for us in the future, right now it's not, um, not really impactful for us. Instead, entity recognition is pretty big for us, right? And you can see, based on the paragraph that's on the screen, you can see what entity recognition typically does for you. Gives you classes on top of the information to tell you what the individual tokens or words represent. Um, and then docu document classification we use quite heavily. This also helps you set context, helps you understand what kind of page you're dealing with. Is it a, um, a submission or an application? Is it a policy declarations page or an endorsement? Having that context helps us understand a little bit more about what part of the ontology we're filling in. And then summarization that is listed here, those really are the product of all of the inference and all the calculation we're doing boiled up into that ontological model that I described earlier. Okay, so here's an example of structural processing to try to make it a little bit more clear. This is a Sean Penn movie poster. Bottom of the screen, uh, you'll see some entity recognition that's been done on text that would give our OCR absolute fits because of just how thin and how stretched it is. Uh, but you'll see here the bounding boxes that are laid over the actor names, the production company names, as well as the sort of casting or the production roles that exist in a movie. So determining that the pledge was directed by Sean Penn is a matter for us of finding that directed by class or finding a class that represents the production role that has the value of directed by and then finding the person that has the value of Sean Penn adjacent to it, right? So maybe we, we use a heuristic that says it's to the left or maybe we use a pairwise distance and an angle of incidence that's fed into a, a graph classifier. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. You'll have to work for us to find out specifically what we're doing there. Okay, uh, conceptual summaries, we'll just talk a little bit about. Um, this is, you can think of this as a traditional, like an object model, um, is really a categorization of the information where we're trying to understand the cardinality and we're trying to understand the type. So the range and domain of the values. And the reason why we do this is it gives us reliable priors. If we do a good job of the generalization at the ontology level, then we have reliable priors that can be used across a set of different classification techniques to give us summaries that are comparable across different kinds of documents. So uh, success for us in this case looks like taking a policy binder letter, which is like a summary of your insurance coverage and extracting the material terms from it, building a model that represents the insurance product that the binder is specifying, and then doing the exact same thing on a policy. And then comparing those two different document sources, but the summaries that are done on like terms. Um, probably another more concrete example is you might have a, a general liability policy from a large Swiss insurance carrier, and you might have a general liability policy from a large French insurance carrier, and you want to know what's materially different in terms between these two policies. And sometimes it can be the nature of the wording on an individual endorsement or form. But most often what you're interested in is the premiums, the limits, the deductible values, um, and some of these other hardcore sort of insurance values and understanding how they apply. So you need to summarize both of those and then make a comparison between them to save a human being from doing exactly that same analysis. Okay, This is a case where, again, this is not something that you would ask a five-year-old to do from their innate abilities although it depends on a facility with language. But what we're doing is we're mimicking that facility of language in a very constrained way. And then that mimicry allows us to accomplish the same outcome, which is an intelligent comparison between these two complex documents in very different structures. Okay, so that's the, really the root sort of description of our product policy check, which is one of the products we build on top of this architecture that consists of textual classification, structural classification and heuristics, and then ontologies. Okay, The policy check product for us is an important product. It helps both brokers and carriers 
with the quality of the documents as well as the quality of the decisions they make about the insurance products they're offering customers. I'm going to show you some examples now that are a little more concrete about that. These are actual screenshots taken from our application where you'll see different structures and then the ability to identify the information and make it comparable. So we'll see. Um, so here's an example from uh, Binder, which is at the top in the actual insurance policy. In this case, they want to make sure that the broker that received the Binder is the one that we are crediting with the policy. Okay. For us, this is a matter of correctly recognizing the entity, correctly contextualizing the entity on the page. So knowing how far it is from some of the labels that define it, and then scrubbing it against the list of known brokers that we have in the knowledge graph. And that helps us say that this prediction is the broker name prediction. And we do that on both documents. And then we build the summary that says for this particular insurance product, the broker of record on it is Ford and Perlman. Okay. You see uh, another um, example. This is a binder on the top and again, a policy on the bottom where we're talking very specifically about the limits. In this case, they're in different table layouts. Um, they're kind of close. They're different in name and they're a little bit different in structure. And from this standpoint, we're able to say, okay, we can identify the full limit value. We can identify the coverage it applies to. We can make an assumption about the basis of this particular coverage. Uh, the second one, the medical payments, you'll see the basis is actually explicitly found there, which is $5,000 is the limit that they'll pay for auto, auto accident related medical for each person that's insured under the, the policy. So we make the, the machine is able to make a summary from the binder and a summary from the policy here that says that these limits are more or less equivalent, which is why they're showing up in green. Okay, show you one more, um, possibly two. This one is again, very similar. It's from a, a general liability policy. Um, all of this paper is from the same customer. So it has some of the same feel to it, but we do manage on a wide variety of carrier and broker paper. So it looks um, different. This is just the examples that I was cutting up for the demo. So we've got employee benefits per occurrence, million dollar limit laid out in that table. Uh, in the actual policy that shows up as a particular form attached to the policy later is a completely separate page. The actual name of the coverage comes from the title. Okay, and then we have the actual limit and basis values down here. And we, again, we use the structural aspect, both the document class for the individual page, as well as the entities that are recognized on that page, the distances between them, the angles between them, they all feed into classification that helps us build these associations. Uh, to build the summary from this page that tells us it's the same as this rather straightforward table on the next page. Okay. And then the last one is a little bit about entity context. Um, sometimes we get multi policy documents. These are documents that reference more than one policy. And we're working to check just one of the policies in the document with the one that um, that's submitted to the application. So in this case, we've got a GL proposal that's got three different lines of business in it, right? It's got GL, it's got auto, and it's got workers comp, three different kinds of insurance in that same proposal. They all have policy numbers. They all have limit values on them. What we wanna make sure is that we apply the right product ontology, that we apply the general liability one that represents the policy to the proposal document that has three or more products in it than we would expect. And then be able to correctly correlate the right values across that domain from inside of that transaction. Okay, so if, I, if I'm you know taking away to sort of summarize the, the entirety of the presentation, things I would say, um, there's a lot of hype and a lot of exaggeration about what's possible. Our best machines right now are dog brains. That's great because there's lots of problems we can solve with dog brains. There's also lots of problems we should be wise enough to avoid. Co-reference resolution, if your problem requires it, you have a lot of work to do. If you can mimic your way past it, you can be really, really successful. Um, we use a stack of things that are commercially viable, commercially available today. 
to do, you know, like you say, entity references as well as um, document classes, as well as all the spatial relationships and helping those things classify the connections to each other. Okay, we use that and we use a constrained ontology. It's another sort of vital aspect of successful application of natural language understanding at this stage is that you really do have to have a constrained domain you're working in, a model that you can build that categorizes the information in that domain well, and then you wanna use the priors in that model and the information you build from processing documents in that model to build out everything you need to support higher precision, to suppress false positives and to help you get um, much better accurate results. Now, over time, those things might simplify. You may find that there's opportunities to combine your structural models and your pure language models, and there might be additional classification techniques that come up. There might be, you know, rapid advancements that turns your dog brain into, you know, some lower primate brain in the next five years. Those are all good things. But in the current context, when you want to deliver value to customers today and make the revenue that allows you to support all those things, being able to stack these techniques together and constrain your problem will lead you to um, better results faster. What for you was that light bulb moment that made you decide, you know what, I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to put a C in front of my name. I'm going to start a shop myself. I'm curious to get your thoughts and on what um, that, that light bulb moment was. Well, I mean, I can tell you a bit about the light bulb moment that encouraged me to join Chisel. I, I didn't found Chisel. I see. Um, I, what I can tell you concretely is, so I work with Pearl and Jason and Helen and Ron uh, and Tracy. Like we have this uh, outstanding leadership team, including Chris Labor. All of them are fantastic individuals, and I was fortunate enough to work with a couple of them in a commercial insurance software provider back around 2005 or 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and transparently, I left with my tail between my legs. Uh, it was really hard. Commercial insurance, um, it was frustrating and difficult for me as a young technologist because they do everything in paper, and everything is very exceptional and very specific and very complex. And it seemed like it was resistant to any generalization that makes for good systems. It was very hard. I, I then spent a few years building a very large software as a service for Oracle. And during that time, Amazon approached me and I got the opportunity to help found a Toronto development site for Amazon, which was an amazing experience. But it also introduced me to Amazon's use internally of natural language processing. And I had a moment around 2012 or 2013 as I watched Amazon automate chunks of its customer service workflow through natural language understanding that made me realize that um, this would be uh, the solution to the problem I had back in 2006. This would be the way that we could attack the complexity and the nature of um, commercial insurance being so flexible and so language dependent and so paper-based that there was real technology now that could help them with the mission of digital transformation that really, to be honest, they've been talking about for 20 years. So when I had that realization, I was like, okay, somebody's going to do that. Um, a couple of years later, Jason McDermott, who I worked with um, early in my career, joined Ron at Chisel. And I learned a little bit about the company. And it was one of those things where it's like, they're doing it. They're doing the <laughs> thing that I recognized in 2012 and, um, at Amazon, they're going to disrupt the way commercial insurance is placed by making the paper machine accessible. Um, and when I learned that, it was like, uh, that was really, really interesting. And then a few months later, a friend of mine reached out to me. He's a mutual friend of the founders and executive team at Chisel, reached out to me and said, you should join this company because they're doing the thing that you've always talked about. <laughs> uh, and so I did some interviewing joined the company and really haven't looked back since. So, you know, it's a, uh, the company has a really interesting founder story. I invite people to go to the website and sort of read up a bit about that. Ron, um, Ron has a great story and a lot of passion for applying natural language processing. Uh, for me, it makes so much fit sense with this market that I was excited about the opportunity that way. 
I wonder if in your industry, the data security and privacy is important and how this could affect the implementation of your models. Great question there. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's an outstanding question. Uh, we're fortunate in some dimensions and challenged in others. So the thing that I will say is that with most commercial insurance, the entities involved are legal public entities that don't have the same privacy expectations as individuals. So if we were doing life insurance or personal lines auto, for example, the ability to model well and accurately the entities we need to recognize when those entities need to be redacted or obfuscated would be a challenge because we don't really want people's names or their VIN numbers or those other things to be languishing in our training sets any longer than they absolutely must. Uh, with commercial insurance, however, these are public entities. They don't have the same expectation of privacy that an individual has. They do have expectations of privacy. They do have material non-public information. They do have risks related to those kinds of information. You'll notice there's a little bit of redaction in my presentation to hide what is um, permissible for the end users of the application to see, but not necessarily appropriate for a form like this. So there are privacy and information security measures that we take. Um, data residency is a big deal for us. Uh, handling the data, expiring it properly, deleting it when it's no longer needed um, is all important for us. Uh, but it doesn't have the same privacy focus, for example, at the work that we were doing at Integrate AI has. Uh, what's next for Chisel? What are you excited about for the future? Ah, okay. So um, extracting, summarizing the information is really, really exciting for us. Uh, the next step is going to be powering, I think, a set of models and a set of products that are not just effort reducers and not just um, simple decision support, like we talk about with policy check, but much more impactful to premium for commercial insurers. So to give you an idea, uh, a broker will prepare a submission and send it off to 10 insurers. Those commercial insurers will get hundreds, if not thousands of those a week. And they read a much smaller percentage of them and make the decision based on what they read to bind some of that business. So the data, the opportunity for a carrier, for example, is locked up in that paperwork and it is gated or attenuated by the availability of human brain glucose to get the information out of that paperwork. Where we come in is we can get that information out a lot easier. We can make it machine accessible. And then once it's machine accessible, we can build a family of models that does things like uh, predict the propensity to bind a particular submission and help that submission float to the top of an underwriter's queue instead of being buried under the last five submissions that came in. So prioritization of submissions is a really interesting thing for us. Um, benchmarking quotes is a really interesting thing for us. Um, helping the underwriters uh, complete the view they have of a company using all the data that we can mine from all the submissions that come in, um, helping them understand where there's some, maybe some missing information that's crucial to the underwriting decision that can be imputed or uh, getting feedback back to a broker quickly about providing that information without a human being having to be the person who asked that broker, make the system possible to receive that broker's submission and get feedback back to the broker quickly.